we have uh, here for the first time, I'm sorry, the second time, Robert J. Groden, co-author of J. Uh, F.K. The Case for Conspiracy, uh, co-author of High Treason, and uh, he is both of them landmark studies on the assassination of JFK, which the case will fortunately not go away. Robert Groden created the famous optical enhancement of the Zapruder film of the shooting, uh, which was instrumental in reopening the investigation in uh, 1976. And his involvement in the case has included testifying before the House Assassination Committee hearings. He worked with uh, Oliver Stone as a photographic um, expert and provider. And if I recall, he, um, Robert Groden has the largest photo collection of the entire crime uh, that, there, that there exists. And he was with us about a year and a half ago, and he slipped into town and we grabbed him. So welcome back to the show, Robert. Thanks, Roy. It's great to be back. High Treason uh, has been out now for how long? Oh, let's see, about five years. Five years. Now I hear tell that there's something else that's going to be coming off of the assembly line in the near future. Well, actually, uh, two two things. Uh, we for years now, people have been asking me, uh, would I make the uh, visuals of the assassination available, uh, the films, the photographs, and what have you. And we have produced a videotape called JFK: The Case for Conspiracy, named after my first book with Peter Modell. And uh, it's going to be an hour and 45 minutes, and it's going to include virtually everything that exists on the assassination in the way of films and, and the most important of the slides. And we've uh, finally put this together. We've gotten, it, what's held it up so long is it's taken a lot to get the clearances. Uh, people own copyrights on a lot of this stuff, and uh, it has not been easy. Uh, but uh, Ed Cherini and I have put together this, uh, this videotape, which we are very, very proud of. And we just finished uh, editing it in Dallas a few days ago, and it'll be out within the next few weeks. Uh, videotape, how is that going to be distributed? Well, we're going to distribute it ourselves uh, at first because we're not sure that we can trust uh, the mainline distributors on this. We've uh, gone through a great deal of trouble to maintain the maximum quality uh, on the footage. There's a, a great many uh, researchers out there that want to be able to study the footage uh, and uh, we don't want to cut any corners with this thing. It's uh, we're keeping the, we're keeping the price as low as we possibly can on this. Uh, it's cost an awful lot to put together, uh, and the cost is going to be twenty seven ninety five, including shipping and handling. But it will be available here also in uh, the the Mandela Bookstore uh, in Santa Monica uh, when it comes out. There'll, there'll be the uh, local distributors here. They'll have it. Uh, but if anybody wants to order it from uh, from us, if I if I may, I'll give the address. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's uh, it would be New Frontier Video, and that's P.O. Box two one six four, Boothwin. That's B-O-O-T-H-W-Y-N, Pennsylvania, one nine zero six one. And again, that'll be twenty-seven ninety-five, including shipping and handling. We're not charging uh, an arm and a leg for that either. We want to make sure everyone who wants this can get their hands on it. Okay. Well, that address will be at the KPFK switchboard, and um, uh, <laughs> we're sort of not supposed to give the price and the location. Oh, but, shame on uh, me! I didn't know yeah, that. But that's okay. Well, um, I, I didn't even mention the book yet, so I won't even say where that'll be available. <laughs> Okay, well, there, the a video and the book. Well, the book is a separate entity. The book is called The Killing of a President, and it'll be out in October. And uh, this is pretty much uh, the, along the same lines as the tape. Uh, no one has ever been able to put together a photographic uh, analysis and essay on the Kennedy assassination. And people have been asking again for this information for a lot of years. And uh, we've put together 650 of the most important photographs and film frames relating to the assassination. 600 and... 650. God, your high treason had a paltry 186. That's right. Good memory. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but uh, again, the, uh, there's always been a shortage of color because of the extreme expense involved. 
uh, this book is going to have color on virtually every page. Wherever a photograph was available in color, it'll be available here in color. Well, one of the problems with all the photographic evidence now is that there's, as May Brussel predicted many years ago, that as soon as they find a really neat way to falsify photographic evidence, then all the photographic evidence is going to come out into the uh, public arena. And it has been coming out the last few years of autopsy photos and then false autopsy photos and and uh, it's just it's this incredible morass that you have the false you have you have to be practically a photographic expert which you are a photographic expert to be able to distinguish between the real and the phony well you're absolutely right Roy, and that's that's the major problem we've got here uh, and it's a double-edged sword, too. There are several so-called researchers out there that really don't know their rear end from a hole in the ground, or to be more accurate in this case, an F-stop. I think that's exactly accurate, actually. Well, it is, but in this particular case, an F-stop from a bus stop, <laughs> because uh, they're, saying, they're saying really, really ridiculous things about a lot of the uh, photographic evidence in the Kennedy case. And it's, it's ultra-critical, because right now you're correct, absolutely correct. Uh, photographs can be faked and phonied on a digital level in a computer and without a magnifying glass you can't tell the difference uh, and the purpose of getting this book out now is to collect together all of the evidence that we've gotten through the years many of which have been available in, uh, in inferior uh, form before in other ways but now they'll be available in their pristine form before it's too late uh, many of them are fading, many of them uh, have uh, started to, dis to disappear People are charging as much as $1,500 a piece for the reproduction on some of these. Other people won't let them be reproduced. And uh, this, this is intolerable. This, the, the Kennedy assassination was a pivotal point in this nation's history. And the suppression of this evidence is absolutely unforgivable. Uh, we can't forget that Life magazine bought the film uh, of the assassination taken by Abraham Zapruder on November 24, 1963, two days after the assassination. And until I was able to show it on Good Night America in 1975, thanks to Geraldo Rivera's courage, uh, the, the American people had never seen it. Only individual selected frames within Life magazine. But we did see Dan Rather describing it to us. Oh, sure we did. And uh, Dan Rather apparently needed a new pair of glasses because anyone who has ever seen the Zapruder film knows that the two most important and, and um, outstanding features are, number one, the, the horrible explosion of the president's head, but the fact is that he was thrown violently to the rear. Uh, the only person who has ever looked at that film and said the president was thrown forward was Dan Rather. And for years he let that stand, and only after being challenged on it time and time and time again did he finally say in his book, The uh, Camera Never Blinks, uh, I'm, I made a, an honest error. Well, it was an error, but I doubt that it was honest. Um, now, you worked with uh, Oliver Stone on the JFK film, yes. which uh, was a great education that, uh, to me, uh, in the, the greatest part of that education being the, the uh, tumult against Oliver Stone from the press, the right-wing press, the middle-wing press, and the left-wing press. Everybody hated Oliver Stone in the press, the critics, and that they hated the movie a great movie, uh, JFK, and um, until then I had no idea how solid the opposition to the uh, solving of the, uh, well, the takeover of the country, in my estimation, and among many, uh, how solid the opposition to the um, facts of the crime coming out. Well, one of the major news magazines uh, had on their cover uh, a story about, about the movie JFK, and they said, uh, don't trust anybody who knocks this film. And I can't put it any better than that. The people who attacked JFK attacked JFK because they had to protect their own credibility. They would invested their own credibility for all those years, attacking uh, Jim Garrison, uh, attacking the, uh, the critics, and here comes a fabulous major motion picture with the power to let people know exactly what's been going on. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the people uh, from the Washington Post and uh, other establishment uh, rags uh, have come out and attacked uh, a movie, a movie before it was even made, before it was released. 
uh, because of a stolen script. Somebody here on the West Coast stole a script and sent it to an East Coast re researcher, uh, and that researcher leaked it to the um, uh, uh, Washington Post. And based on this early script, which bore very little resemblance to the final movie, started to attack it. That's unique. That has never happened in the history of show business or politics. It's rather bizarre. And when you look at the track record of the people that attacked the movie, you can see that this is nothing new for them. They've been doing this since the 1960s. And uh, it's, I think that if we, if we keep track of those who attack the movie, we can tell the good guys from the bad guys. Yes, uh, there was a lot of exposure that went on. It was like sending up a flare and seeing where the uh, opposition was arranged <laughs> on the battlefield. But I was really quite amazed at the, uh, at the breadth of the opposition. That was true. In, in virtually all the press and, and the so-called left-wing press, too, uh, everybody dumped on Oliver Stone. And, uh, but it didn't hurt the movie too bad. Uh, could you could you describe any change that's happened in this case and in the investigation of this case since the movie? Did the movie make any kind of permanent change in the uh, search for truth of, of the, the assassination? Well, the vast majority of the American people never believed that there was uh, a lone assassin. The single uh, bullet theory. Uh, is a joke. It's a fairy tale that would have been rejected by Mother Goose. Yet uh, those in power uh, seem to want us to buy it. They're the only ones who do. 95% of the American people don't buy it anyway. But what Oliver did is he explained to the people why they inherently did not believe it. They, uh, they knew in their heart of hearts that this was uh, fertilizer, if you will, because it is radio and we don't want to lose your license, but uh, use your imagination. Anyway, the, um, the thing is that Oliver explained what the intricacies of the cover-up were, and people became aware uh, for the first time why they didn't believe, that it wasn't just uh, an inherent feeling that they were having. But the major change that has happened in, in one direction is uh, that which relates to the cover-up of the uh, House Assassinations Committee and Warren Commission documents that have been illegally classified in the uh, uh, or immorally, anyway, classified within the um, National Archives, hidden away in the case of the uh, Warren Commission until the year 2039, and uh, in the case of the House Assassinations Committee until 2029, away from public view. What for? If Lee Harvey Oswald is a lone nut assassin and there's no connections to intelligence agencies, what is there to hide? What's anyone afraid of? And uh, Oliver, in the closing uh, moments of... Uh, of uh, JFK mentioned that fact, and that has become uh, the uh, cause celeb. Uh, that has gone absolutely uh, far and above the uh, rest of the issues in the case. And there have been movements going on now. There's the JFK uh, documents bill. By the end of next month, all the stuff, or a great deal of this stuff, is supposed to be reviewed and much of it released. Yet nobody seems to be making any steps in that direction. But it, it is, it is finally at least uh, uh, in the public uh, consciousness that this exists. The only problem that we've got with this is that now everyone's going to start to think that all of the, uh, the issues relating to the assassination conspiracy are going to be found in those documents, and that's not the case. If anyone thinks we're going to find a memo that says, hey guys, just for posterity, I killed the president, they're going to be sadly mistaken. What we will see, though, is how the cover-up took place, if, unless they destroy all the documents or those things were never placed there in the first place. These people are protecting their own rear ends. They are not going to leave anything behind, any kind of a paper trail that's going to uh, uh, implicate them in an open cover-up. You know, so the JFK files is, has been described as like leaving a uh, Mercedes-Benz parked in... Uh, uh, the South Bronx. The South Bronx <laughs> for 25 years, and you come back, and it's not going to be quite in same uh, shape. Uh, there was a recent, I've been advised, there was a recent JFK assassination convention in Chicago? Yes. Uh, it was a rather interesting one, as a matter of fact. Uh, in the middle of a, of a blizzard, <laughs> we, we had this, con this conference uh, put on uh, for, uh, let's see, uh, I was trying to think, it was three or four days, and uh, it was remarkable. Uh, there were 
representatives of both sides of the issues, researchers, uh, critics, authors on our side, uh, members of the House Assassinations Committee uh, that were just up in arms about the cover-up that they were forced to participate in. Um, on one side. On the other side, we had the apologists for the medical community um, and, uh, and, and the Warren Commission. And it was a very, very involved, active confrontation. Uh, the degree and the slyness of the cover-up, uh, specifically involved with the people uh, with uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, was remarkable to see that these people would get up in front of an audience that knows better and still try to convince them that what they're saying is true. Expert and testimony, they think that carries, uh, authority carries more weight than the truth. Well, one thing that was really fascinating was that, the, and for those who may not be aware, uh, over the last year or so, the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, has published a large number of articles on the Kennedy assassination, many of them grossly dishonest. Um, George Lundberg is the editor that uh, did all this. Uh, he got together the three autopsy physicians, uh, doctors Humes, Boswell, and Fink, and interviewed them and got them to say, hey, we didn't screw up. Uh, we, we did a good job. And, you know, they're judging themselves, and they're covering for themselves. Lundberg is a, an ex-military uh, doctor himself, and these people are in the same line of work. It's good for all concerned to keep this quiet. So they publish uh, the statements of uh, Dr. Humes, the chief autopsist, and he says, um, we, we did a really good job, and the wounds are exactly where we said they were. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> where, where they said they were when? when he testified under oath before the Warren Commission that the entrance wound was in the rear of the president's head just above the hairline where he swore under oath or the way he swore under oath in 1978 in front of the House Assassinations Committee that the wound, the very same wound, was four and a half inches higher in the cowlick area. Which one? Because now he's moved it back down again. I think there's two different gods involved in the oath, so it depends which god he's um, swearing to. Now, when one of the autopsy surgeons has come out strong and s remained a strong opposition to the Warren Commission. Of the of the Warren, well, the three autopsists have uh, have kept on their side. They they they're not changing their minds at all. But um, Dr. Cyril Wecht, who um, is a, a remarkable man, uh, a man who who is a personal idol of mine a doctor, a lawyer, he has more letters after his name than Carter's got liver pills. Uh, or the new Carter has peanuts, what can I say? Uh, this guy is absolutely phenomenal. He, he is so strong that he's referred to by Warren Commission apologists as the darling of the assassination critics. Um, Cyril has brought up the challenges on a medical level that none of us that lay people uh, would have the capability of doing. And uh, he testified before the uh, House Assassinations Committee, as did I, and we were the only two dissenters. He dissented on the, uh, for the medical panel, I for the photographic panel. And um, he asked the simple questions, uh, the simple questions that relate to the, uh, the ability of the rifle to fire two shots in less time than anyone has ever been able to fire that rifle, about the medical evidence, about the lack of testing of specific metal fragments that are supposed to be from the so-called magic bullet, which of course are reflected in today's headlines about Governor Connolly being buried without the remaining fragments being removed from his wrist, back, and thigh. Um, it's inexcusable. And then the government says, well, Mrs. Connolly didn't want it to happen. The family didn't want it to happen. Since when, in the history of this nation, has one family had precedence over and control over an active investigation in the murder of the President of the United States. This is unbelievable that this is going on. I mean, I have, I, you know, I've met Mrs. Connolly, and she's a very nice lady. I met Governor Connolly. I think he was a very honest man. But I'll tell you one thing. It is not up to any one person or any one family to suppress evidence in this case until every single metal fragment that is alleged to come from CE-399, the magic bullet, is tested. We have no way of knowing, and nobody on the other side should have the gall to state that, that there was only one bullet involved. What have they got to lose? What would it take 
uh, a half an hour to remove the metal fragments, uh, to do an active uh, examination of Governor Connolly's body in an autopsy. I mean, it would happen if it was Joe Smith or George uh, George Green or, or whatever, whoever it was, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. USA, whoever it might be. Uh, it would it could happen in a minute. If it was any other murder, it would have happened, but not in this one. They're still scared. Now, a lot of us have hopes up because President Clinton was elected president. He's a big Kennedy fan. He's inspired by Kennedy. He looks like Kennedy, sort of, and he loved Kennedy. And he's a Kennedy. He's a he's a Kennedy disciple in many ways or sees himself that way and uh, I was hoping that with his election there might be serious movement toward opening up the uh, the case to well, the truth we really thought so because both he and Al Gore have stated publicly that there was a cons that they believe that there was a conspiracy in the murder of President Kennedy and a presidential order right now could turn this entire case upside down but I think that he's in the same position that Jimmy Carter was and everybody else. It's just the one subject that nobody wants to touch. It's too terrifying to them. The murder of President Kennedy in 1963 was more than just the, the killing of one man. This entire nation changed. All of history changed. President Kennedy was going to withdraw us from Vietnam. There's no question about that. Uh, his National Security Action Memorandum 263 called for our withdrawal from Vietnam. He had said to several people they would have us out of Vietnam by the end of 1964. He said it and he meant it. He had already, already withdrawn the first 1,000 troops. It was over. It never would have escalated. There never would have been a formal military presence except as an, an advisory uh, capacity as it had been. Um, Apologists uh, for the Warren Commission and revisionist historians say John Kennedy got us into Vietnam. Baloney. We had been in Vietnam since 1949. Uh, we, at the time of his death, in 1963, President Kennedy's death, there was not a single military person more than was there at the time he took over. That included advisors? That Did included he? advisors. There Did was he? not. He didn't increase the amount of advisors no, from the, two to thirteen thousand. No, there were, there were there were the same number of advisors, the same U.S. presence there. There's not a single one more than when he took office. When he died, we still did not have military presence there in a formal capacity. Uh, all the orders were going through the ambassador and the embassy. Uh, it was the CIA's war, plain and simple. They wanted it. He wanted to stop it. And that was open warfare between them. There were a lot of other reasons, too. But certainly that, that had something to do with his death, beyond any question. Um, I was told that there is a relatively unknown but public talk that JFK delivered, a rather prophetic talk that he delivered, I think it was at the White House or in the Rose Garden or from the balcony in the White House. The press were there, but there weren't a lot of people about three days before he left on the trip before uh, going to Dallas. Do you know anything about that talk? No. I've never heard of it before tonight. Uh, I have been told that the uh, Dallas Police Department uh, interrogate 14-hour interrogation of Lee Harvey Oswald, which we've been told was not recorded in, or in, in any way, was actually taped. This is true. It was. Um, the tapes still do exist, and they're in private ownership, unfortunately. We really do need them. But uh, what happened was, uh, officially, uh, during uh, Captain Fritz's interrogation of Oswald, uh, everyone said there were so many people in that room, they couldn't bring in a tape recorder. Come on. <laughs> I mean, that's ridiculous. First of all, the room was bugged in the first place. It was wired. It was an interrogation room. Uh, but... Uh, for some reason, Fritz did not want people to know about that, so he kept the tapes secret and hidden. And they are on reel-to-reel -reel tape, and uh, they are in private possession now, and we've been trying for about seven years now, since we discovered that they existed, to get them back. And um, we have to walk very carefully. The fellow who has them was a real right-winger and does not, did not like President Kennedy. We're afraid the tapes may be destroyed. Hmm. Um... The 
last guest I had talking on JFK assassination found out that the uh, phony Dallas police with the tramps were really, really Dallas police. Have you heard about that? Well, they may very well have been uh, legitimate policemen. Uh, one of them is identified. Uh, the other one, uh, so far as I know, is not. I've never had any problem with accepting the fact that they were real policemen. There are a lot of legends in the Kennedy case, a lot of things that people really grasp onto. Uh, for instance, uh, well, among, among the looniest of the bunch is that the Secret Service driver, Bill Greer, turned around and shot the president. Uh, right in plain view of hundreds of people, yet nobody saw it happen. And the Zabruder film shows that it didn't happen. Yet this guy, who lives here in California, uh, Bill Cooper is his name, has convinced tens of thousands of people that it actually happened. And the way he did it was to take a substandard copy of the Zabruder film and through the power of suggestion, called the reflection of sunlight off of Roy Kellerman. Now, Roy Kellerman was sitting right next to Bill Greer, the driver. And the sun is reflecting off his forehead and the top of his head at a right angle, approximate right angle. And it looks a little bit like a gun. It looks that has that shape. Yeah, in, a, in, de in degraded copies of the film, uh, when you cut out the, uh, the color saturation and, and, and uh, turn it into a monochrome image with just black and white and shades of gray, uh, and you can't see the skin tone anymore, and if you eliminate the gray scale in the middle, then you get a high contrast image, and all the grays that appear in between drop out. And all you've got is this very bright image against a dark background. And if you tell somebody that's a gun, they're going to believe you. And that's what he's done. He does know better, but he keeps pushing the same line again and again. That's just one. Another, uh, another thing that we uh, honestly, legitimately, and innocently grabbed onto is there was a photograph taken by Associated Press photographer James Altkins during the center of the shooting sequence. And it shows the president and the, and the car in the foreground, and in the background is the doorway of the depository. And in the doorway is a man who resembles remarkably Lee Harvey Oswald. The man is actually Billy Nolan Lovelady, who worked in the depository, who looked so much like Oswald that a week before the assassination, Billy's wife uh, came to the depository, saw Oswald across the room and called him over to, to tell him something, not realizing that it wasn't, in fact, her husband. So, uh, you know, the man was indeed Lovelady, but a legend started that it was Oswald in the doorway, therefore he couldn't have fired the shots. Well, the problem we had was that, seven, that uh, five minutes before and 72 seconds after that photograph was taken, Oswald was seen in the same spot on the second floor. Why would he go down to the first floor and then go back up again? And it was a real problem. Uh, finally, we were able to prove that it was Lovelady in the doorway and not Oswald. Uh, in my first book, JFK, The Case for Conspiracy, with Peter Modell, uh, I said that it, indeed it was Oswald, based on the best evidence that we had, and it seemed to be. But then, working for the House Assassinations Committee around the middle of 1978, I discovered that, in fact, I had been wrong. That, in fact, it was indeed Billy Lovelady. And I was the first to admit it. I was wrong. I mean, this investigation is an evolutionary type of thing. It, it doesn't, it's not all black and white and you can't change your mind. If new evidence comes up, you have to be honest enough when you've made a mistake to admit it. And that's what I've always tried to do. Uh, there may be somebody out there with this, with this new book that I'm publishing or the videotape uh, and that will find something new that I've missed. We're still learning new things. For instance, we just found out early this year uh, that, in fact, Governor Connolly was hit earlier than we ever thought was possible before. And there is a three-quarter of a second time lapse between the time the president was hit and the time Connolly was hit, where before we thought there was 1.6 seconds. There's actually far less. But this is all new, and it's all going to be in the book and the tape. But, I mean, this is something we have to learn to accept. We can't, we can't be closed-minded about this. If somebody were to come up with proof and say that Lee Harvey Oswald did it, I'd say, fine, I can finally get back to living a normal life. <laughs> but so far, there hasn't been a darn thing that's ever been brought up by anybody uh, that would show that this is true. In a court of law, he would have been acquitted. There was no evidence against him. Now, we saw your uh, presentation, your live presentation, back a year and a half ago in the Robert Frost Auditorium, and uh, it was really astounding. You have a recreation of, there are, there are actually five films, there are five films that were taken in Dealey Plaza at that time, of which four are not being 
uh, hidden by the CIA. They have one one film. Well, the FBI, the, the FBI, FBI, the FBI has one film taken by Beverly Oliver, uh, which has become, become known as the Babushka Ladies film. Uh, the other, the other four are Abraham Zapruder's uh, film, uh, Orville Nix Sr.'s film, uh, Murray Muchmore's film, and Charles Bronson's film. The Bronson film, I was told I could include in the videotape, uh, but at the last moment, uh, the people involved reneged. So that will not be on this one. Uh, through legal channels, we're going to try to get it on the next tape in the series. Uh, but uh, I, had to, I had to pull it out of this one. I tried to put it in, and I couldn't. But the other three, the Zapruder film, the Nick's film, and the Muchmore film, will be in this documentary. And uh, for people that have only seen the Zapruder film through the years, the other two are quite remarkable. They're taken from the other side of the street, and they confirm what the first one shows. Uh, and the importance is here, uh, one or two of the um, lunatic fringe in the Kennedy case have uh, said publicly that the, the Zapruder film is, is doctored because the film, the film uh, has to be doctored because the motorcade stopped completely in the plaza. Well, this is pure lunacy. Uh, they said that the Zapruder film was cut and sections were cut out. Well, what about all the people that are running in the background? There's a total continuity there. If the film was stopped and anything was slugged out, people that were jumping would be running to one point and then would jump like 10, 15, 20 feet away and when the film picked up again. They don't understand photo analysis. They don't understand film. Uh, and they're coming out making statements uh, to the public and people who really care about this. And that's inexcusable. It's not just a matter of, of, uh, of an opinion at this case uh, or at this stage of the game. It's because they have their own theories about what happened. And when something disagrees with it, like the Zapruder film or an eyewitness, then they've got to attack that evidence to defend their own theory. And instead of saying, well, maybe the theory is wrong. Now, uh, I just saw a clip of the, uh, the fellow who starred in the Ruby film. Um, Danny Aiello? Yeah, and he was talking about, uh, not, not proclaiming to be an expert, but he endorses the Warren Report until there is other kind of evidence to the contrary, that uh, point of view. Uh, but he said that, that there are people who are making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's like a whole a year. It's a business industry, the Kennedy assassination industry, which is the reason why the uh, there's general non-acceptance of the uh, official government uh, cover story. Well, all I can say to Mr. Aiello, who obviously has never read the Warren Report, if he did, he certainly couldn't believe it. I know of no one who's read it who does believe it. Um, all I can say is, you know, I worked on the film Ruby uh, for a short period of time, um, and I don't know how he can conclude that Oswald did it alone, I mean, and that the Warren Commission was right. Um, as far as an industry goes about this, the only people that have really made money off of this, well, let's see, let's look at, let's look at the track record. Um, I know of maybe three Warren Commission critics that through the years have managed to maybe break even or get a little bit ahead. I personally have lost in excess of $200,000 on this. Uh, every penny we've ever gotten, we've thrown into this, and uh, it's just gone to purchase more and more of the information that we're trying to release to the public. But let's look at the other side of this. David Bellin became a prosperous attorney, became famous because of his work on this. Arlen Specter became a uh, senator. He's Both. not doing very well right now, I understand. Uh, yeah, they just removed the single theory from his head, I've been given to understand. I don't understand uh, what that operation was, really. But anyway, uh, Gerald Ford became president of the United States, um, on and on and on. Uh, you know, they make a lot of money, they get promotions, they go ahead, they become very prosperous, but the honest critics don't. Uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of us through the years that have devoted, well, I've been doing this now for, I guess, let's see, it's been 30 years since the president was killed. I've been doing this for about 28. And if anybody thinks... A late that, starter. <laughs> yeah, I, st I, started, I started nearly two years later. Originally, I thought Oswald did it. I, be I believed that I needed 
emotionally as Jim we all Garrison did. did. You know, Mark Lane did. Exactly. Everybody did. Well, I'm not, I don't know. Mark Lane really uh, was one of the people who really was a true disbeliever very, very early on. Uh, Josiah Thompson, uh, Harold Weisberg, Sylvia Marr, uh, people like that, and Penn Jones. From the very, very beginning, uh, I was a late bloomer, if you will. Um, I started with questions I wanted answered. And it was, to me, initially, on its most basic level, the Kennedy assassination is, in fact, the world's greatest unsolved murder mystery. And I wanted, I wanted to find out if I could find out any of the answers, not thinking that I ever could. Uh, if I'd have realized at the beginning that it was going to take me more than half of my life to get this far with this, uh, I'm not sure whether I would have done it or not. I probably would have. But who would have believed that something like this could go on this long? That here we are three decades later and the government still won't tell us the truth. Uh, we're not making money at this, any of us. Uh, lawyers make a lot of money on this. Uh, Book publishers make a lot on this, but the researchers themselves really don't, uh, and I don't think that any of us ever will. Uh, I don't think that I don't think that any legitimate researcher has ever gone into this hoping to make a dime on it. We've gone in because we want the truth to be known, and there's a lot of truth out there, and the government isn't giving it to us. The news media is not giving it to us, uh, and if it wasn't for a handful of, of researchers and uh, a pitifully small handful of honest uh, radio show hosts like yourself that allowed this type of show to be uh, delivered to the people so that they know that, yes, there, there is an alternative view to this, we, you know, we'd be whistling in the dark. I mean, it would do us no good. Um, the people are aware, as I said before, that there was a conspiracy, and nothing's going to take that away from them. But they've got to know why. They've got to have their beliefs reinforced. They've got to know what the issues are. And if evidence comes up on either side, either for or against, they have the right to know this. But we don't see this on major television network shows. We get garbage. We get lies. We get, uh, we get cover up. We get, we get people running for cover, defending their own rear ends time and time again, year after year, every November. As soon as something comes forward where, where there's some new information, it's got to be suppressed. It's got to be held back. The public can't hear about this. What the hell is everybody so afraid of? If this is an honest government, if this is an honest war, and we, let's face it, we know it's not, but we need to know the truth in this, in this matter. It's more, and, and people, people ask this a lot. They say, it's been 30 years now. What does it matter? Let him rest in peace. What does it matter? The President of the United States, the most powerful man in the world, the only man who was doing anything to try to change the status quo, trying to make things better for, for everybody, for not just because of, of political ties or, or personal gain. This man was murdered. Look at, th think about this for a second, everybody. This man was murdered because he tried to do the right thing. And the powers that be were too afraid of losing their meal ticket no matter what it was, whether it was the mob, whether it was the military, whether it was the CIA, whether it was the ultra-right wing, no matter who it was, whether or it was all. all of them, any combination of above, we don't know, 20, 29 and a half years later, who killed John Kennedy. And that is totally inexcusable. And to turn our backs on it and say it doesn't matter because they've gotten away with it for this long, uh, I can't find words to describe how disgusting that thought is. This is KPFK Los Angeles. We are on the air live as of uh, July 6, 1993 with Robert Groden. It is a six, right? Yes, it yeah. is. Uh, he's author of High Treason, a co-author of High Treason. It's currently on the shelves. Uh, the assassination of President Kennedy and the new evidence of conspiracy. He's coming out with a new not out yet a new videotape what's that going to be called yeah. the new videotape is going to be called JFK the case for conspiracy and uh, the new book out in October will be the killing of a president JFK the case for conspiracy will be available within within the next few weeks and uh, uh, both of them hopefully will help increase the public's consciousness of what's been going on in this case
and the book is going to have is it seven six hundred six hundred and fifty photographs and previously a lot of previously unpublished yes some that have never been published before including the autopsy photographs in color which have never been published before um, now is it possible to look at a computerized falsified photograph and tell that it's a computerized falsified photograph is there yes yes in every case uh, when the computer when the a computer falsifies a photograph it does it in something called pixels or picture elements which are um, rather squarish uh, or uh, in most cases squares but in some cases um, uh, rectangles uh, and when you look at them under a magnifying glass, you can tell, you can see the, uh, the uh, uh, spacing of the contrast and color changes between them. Uh, a photograph uses, instead of pixels, they use grain, photographic grain, which is a smooth transition between one and the other, until you get down pretty close to a microscopic type of level, where you can see the irregularities, but the, they're consistent anyway. And on that level, there is no computer so far that has been able to produce a photograph that cannot be detected as, uh, as being a forgery. Um, none of the work I have done at all has ever dealt with a computer, be, be them photographs or films. Uh, people tend to say computer analysis. I don't use computers because a computer can be programmed to put in whatever you want it to. I deal only with photographic science and the actual mechanical uh, uh, photographic uh, processes for uh, controlling contrast or, or, or brightness. Uh, this sort of, uh, of uh, computer magic which has been going on uh, is kind of frightening and it's kind of wonderful in one way but kind of frightening in another. Uh, and this is, the, this is the case where it is kind of frightening because uh, there was a television program produced in, uh, in England in 1988 which was never released in America. And in this program, somebody had doctored a photograph, and they bought into it. And uh, it shows somebody on the grassy knoll, not anybody else we've ever seen before. Uh, and it was based on a legitimate photograph, but it had been faked. And I told the producers that it had been faked, and they went ahead and released it anyway. Uh, so there is that kind of danger, even in non-computer work. But I think that I think that people will know the truth. Uh, a legitimate critic would not have the uh, would not have the uh, the gall to create a phony photograph like that, because uh, if they were discovered having done it, they would never be taken seriously again. They'd be ostracized for it, and it would only set the uh, the movement backward. And that's uh, something we have to be very careful about. We have to be as honest as we can. Uh, however, there is, there is, there are those that masquerade as critics, who uh, pretend to be and raise a lot of straw, uh, straw men to be knocked down. Um, well, I think it was Livingston's subsequent book, The High Treason, talks about specifically some of these so-called autopsy photos. Or, and uh, one of them, it had the, the floor was wrong. It was, mm. it was well, not the floor of the right hospital where the autopsy was. Well, there was since you furniture that didn't belong there. Since you brought it up. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I like people who are, who are out there to know that I have absolutely nothing to do with High Treason 2. Uh, I'm proud to say I had nothing to do with it. It's a grossly inaccurate book. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I had warned the uh, publisher not to use that title, and they went ahead and did it anyway. I'm in the middle of, a, of uh, quite a lawsuit right now because of it. Uh, a lot of people have... Uh, thought that I had something to do with that awful book, and I had nothing to do with it, and I want them to realize that. Uh, I understand that he's coming out with another book late this year called... Uh, I don't even, I'm not even going to... Yeah, I'm not... Yeah, High Treason... I'm 27. Son of High Treason. Son, <laughs> son of something, I'll tell you. Anyway, he um, he's coming out with a book that attacks the legitimate critics uh, simply because they refuse to bow down to him. And... Uh, you know, this is going to set the movement back even farther than High Treason 2 did. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, it's so hard to make uh, these decisions. And that the, the, the truth is hidden among this incredible morass. It's very difficult. You have almost have to, have to become a professional researcher yourself to um, find out what's going on. 
We are uh, we are talking live with Robert Groden. If it is July 6, 1993, where you are, uh, you have the opportunity to uh, call and talk and question Robert Groden yourself. And uh, I think uh, especially those of you who've been listening to the fun drive probably know the phone number and uh, area code 818-985-KPFK and we'll cross our fingers that the engineer knows how to work the phones. I think I actually have this thing for it working now. Hello? Hello. <laughs> You're on the air with Robert well, Groden. I wonder if I could make a, one real quick observation and ask a question. Speak up a little bit, yes. Okay. Um, av having read several books on the assassination, the uh, one thing that seems to be uh, keep cropping up in the disinformation books is that most of them seem to support the Oswald photos saying that they're uh, genuine uh, which they're obviously not you mean the backyard photographs yeah like the uh, Anthony Summers book uh, the High Trees 2 and uh, the one by I think Edward J. Uh, Epstein yeah the last one by Epstein I think was called The Legend well, the, the, he has a triple book out now for about $15, and it's got a lot of disinformation in it. That doesn't surprise me. But, uh, yeah, you're right. The the, uh, the autopsy photographs are one thing. The photographs of Oswald in the backyard are, are something else again. For those who may not be aware of it, uh, soon after the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, two photographs were found in Oswald's garage uh, uh, where he was staying with uh, Ruth Payne in Irving, Texas. And these photographs purport to show Oswald with the rifle used to kill President Kennedy and the pistol used to shoot Officer Tippett later that, that afternoon. And um, just for good measure, two socialist uh, newspapers, the Militant and the Daily Worker. They're different, uh, different philosoph competing philosophies. Well, two newspapers, I understand. I guess if you're trying to set yourself up as a uh, as a Marxist or to appear as a Marxist, then you would uh, do whatever you could to convince p people that this was indeed the case. In any any in any rate, uh, caller, what what you're saying is absolutely correct. Those photographs are universally condemned as forgeries and and, uh, and fakes by everyone who's ever seen them, including Oswald himself, except for apologists for the other side. And uh, and your observation is correct. The photographs are indeed fakes. Well, didn't they find a cutout in the uh, Dallas Police Department? The the photographic cutout or template or something that was needed to. Yes, and absolutely. That in the Dallas file. They sure did. As a matter of fact, we're going to be publishing all of those. The uh, the template, the um, uh, which we call the ghost of Lee Harvey Oswald, because it's a uh, the backyard photograph with nobody in there. As a matter of fact, just a white cutout, a silhouette of somebody who wasn't even there. Uh, the. Op